Oregon Senate 27th District Debate, presented by Mid-Oregon Credit Union and Whispering Winds. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to News Channel 21's Commitment to Decision 2024. Tonight we have a very special debate with the candidates for the Oregon Senate 27 seat. I'm your host, Lee Anderson, tonight. This may be the one of the most hotly contested debates for the state. And uh, as you can see then the uh, map that we have coming up, the, the uh, okay, the two candidates, we're just getting right into it. The two candidates are Bend City Councilor Anthony Broadman. He served on Bend City Council since 2020. Before that, he worked as an attorney for tribal governments. The next candidate is Michael Summers. He's the owner of a longtime Bend flooring and design business. He's also served as chair of the Redmond School Board since 2021. Our debate tonight will be 30 minutes with two short one minute breaks. Candidates will have one minute to answer questions and a 30 second rebuttal opportunity. Plus one minute for opening and closing statements. Anthony Broadman won our coin toss, which means he goes first for the opening statements. The stage is yours, Mr. Broadman. Thank you, Lee. In 2022, I was serving as mayor pro tem of the city of Bend when I got the call that we had had a terrible shooting at our grocery store. I was concerned for my three daughters. I was concerned for my wife, who's a physician. I was concerned for my community. I rushed to the command center that night and we worked together to make sure that our community was safe. But what I heard in the following days was gratitude from law enforcement officers, from grocery store workers, for putting the tools in place, the training, the resources to ensure that that night we avoided a much worse tragedy. The decisions we make in public service have real life consequences and we cannot allow ourselves to be distracted by culture wars and extremism. That's the kind of pragmatic city councilor I've been. That's the kind of legal counsel I've been for Indian tribes. That's the kind of practical state senator I will be for you. Thank you. All right, very good, sir. It's time for you, Mr. Summers, your opening statement, sir. Good evening. Uh, proud to be in the hallowed halls of Bob Shaw. Just throwing it out there. Uh, my name is Michael Summers. Uh, I am a father of four daughters. I've been married to my amazing wife for 20 years. Uh, I'm the third generation uh, business owner of my family's business here in Central Oregon. Uh, and I am the drummer for Precious Bird. Uh, and also I've been the Redmond chair, uh, uh, school board chair uh, since COVID. And I am excited to be here tonight. Um, I've been on the ground leading a politically diverse school board uh, through some of the toughest educational issues in decades, building bridges and creating consensus. Here's what I've learned. When government is balanced, Extremes get left behind, both sides must work together, and everybody benefits. I want to bring that same common sense approach to Salem. All right, very good, sir. It's time for our first question. It is about education. A recent study by WalletHub found Oregon schools ranked 45th in the country. What role should the legislature play in improving Oregon schools? And Mr. Broadman started first the opening statements, so you get to lead us off, Mr. Summers. Thank you. Uh, so Oregon uh, is frequently at the bottom uh, for education, and it's not because we don't have amazing schools and amazing teachers. Oregon has a problem with being distracted sometimes with shiny objects, and we lose uh, track of what's the main thing. So my goals as um, a board member, and the reason I got involved in politics is to and to be a problem solver, not a partisan, especially in school board. It got very heated, it got very contentious all over the state, and I'm very proud to say that I was able to lead a very diverse political board uh, through COVID in a way that built bridges, that let people know that they were heard, uh, that gave parents options, uh, and I am proud to say we are moving the needle when it comes to uh, basically every metric, uh, when it comes to attendance, when it comes to early childhood literacy, uh, we're making a difference, and what I'd like to do from a, uh, from a state standpoint, is to make sure that we have the funding we need to push through and uh, really take on some of the issues that we've never had to deal with in the past, which is mental health has become, we are now the providers of mental health uh, in a big way. And so we need to make sure that we're funded. All right, very good, sir. It's time for you, Mr. Broadman. Question number one. As the father of three kids in public schools, as the son of a public school teacher, as the brother of a, an amazing public school teacher, I know that the most important job we have in the legislature is to fund and put our kids on an early path to success. My opponent wants to cut the major funding source for the Student Success Act 
And the answer to educating our kids is not to cut funding when we need it the most. We have to adequately fund our schools and we have to hold our students and our schools to the highest standards possible. That means instructional time, better policies, and holding higher outcome standards. But the answer is not to cut funding. And I will always fund adequate both K through 12 and higher ed schools. All right, uh, Michael Summers, you have 30 seconds now to respond to that. Yeah, I think my initial statement rebuts what he just said. I, I want to make sure that schools are actually funded appropriately. They have all the tools at their disposal to make the right decisions for children, uh, and that we are able to fully fund everything we need to get uh, kids caught up, especially after COVID. All right, Mr. Brodman, 30 seconds. I think that was his rebuttal, Lee, right? Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Brodman, you get 30 seconds. Oh, I don't have anything to rebut. He's oh, right. on, re okay. on the record as wanting to cut the major funding source for the Student Success Act, and I think that's all we need to know. All right, we'll move on to question number two, and Mr. Brodman, you start this one. Okay, the next question is about reforms to Measure 110, which now recriminalizes drug use. This means drug users can go to jail and face criminal charges. Do you support these changes, and what, if anything, should be done moving forward? I do support these changes. I think we're on the right path. This is an example of a time when I split with my party. I did not support Measure 110, and I supported recalibrating law enforcement as a dad of three, as a tribal court judge who works in the criminal justice system. I know that our law enforcement need to have the tools to keep our communities safe and just, and I think we're on the right path. There is a lot more work to do in the legislature. We are nowhere near the end of recalibrating what I think was uh, an improper course. And I'm glad that I, uh, that I worked on that at the local public safety coordinating council, worked with our local law enforcement, worked uh, with our state legislators to put us back on the right path. All right, thank you, sir. Mr. Summers. Yeah, Measure 110 was one of those black eyes for Oregon. Uh, I remember when bad ideas used to come primarily from other states. Uh, and unfortunately, that put us front and center nationally. Uh, and it caused our, um, our drugs to uh, explode exponentially. Uh, it really removed all the incentives for, uh, for being a drug dealer in, and a user in Oregon. Uh, and I've, I've remarked before that uh, if we were as hard on drug dealers as we are on business, I think the drug problem would dry up in a heartbeat in Oregon. But instead, we've made it the go-to place uh, to bring your drugs, to, um, to traffic, uh, all sorts of illegal substances with really no teeth behind the laws. Um, the recriminalization of, of uh, uh, and the, the removal of 110 um, and recriminalization of hard drugs is really uh, a, a first step, but it really doesn't go far enough. All right, Mr. Broadman, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, I'm really proud that I am the candidate that the Oregon State police officers, the Oregon State firefighters, the Bend police officers, the Bend firefighters have all endorsed in this race. I'm the candidate. I'm the leader that law enforcement and public safety trust to keep our community safe. I will continue to work with local public safety officials to ensure that our communities are safe, and that has to be our North Star. All right, Michael Summers, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, I'm actually surprised by that. Um, uh, Anthony has gone on record uh, as saying that he actually wants to get rid of cash bail. I had to listen to a podcast uh, where he talks extensively about that, which is really an idea so radical that even San, uh, San Francisco got rid of it and actually got rid of their DA over it. Uh, so I, I doubt that uh, in either of those police uh, organizations knew anything about that. You've also talked about getting rid of qualified immunity, which is what protects police officers and enables them to do their job. Uh, if police officers break the law, they get arrested. But getting rid of a qualified immunity is not the way to do it. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Broadman, it looked like uh, the look on your face said you had something more to add. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. I mean, again, I'm really proud of my uh, service with law enforcement, standing with law enforcement, supporting law enforcement to keep our communities just and safe. Again, I'm the candidate that the Bend Police Officers Association has endorsed, the Oregon State Police Officers. This is a group effort, and the number one priority is that our kids our communities, our small businesses like mine, have a safe community to, to live in. All right, Mr. Summers? Yeah, once again, uh, didn't rebut 
my claim about the uh, get rid of, getting rid of pa uh, cash bail. But um, I think we've seen uh, kind of what the work has been do um, done in Central Oregon when we have skyrocketing crime issues and we have homelessness issues. Um, I'm frankly quite surprised that he has any police endorsements of any kind. All right, let's move on to the third question now. This question turns to a major issue for Central Oregonians, the high cost of housing and rent. Oregon's Office of Economic Analysis currently only allows landlords to raise rent 10% annually. Is that too high? Is it too low? Or is it just right? And should any other protections be added? And Michael Summers, you start this one. Yeah, um, I think anytime you do price fixing, um, it can cr really create some perverse incentives. Uh, markets are really good at sorting out housing. Uh, we have some real issues when it comes to rentals because Oregon has made it really a bad place to own a rental. You basically have no rights as an owner. So we saw squatting during COVID. Uh, we saw people just refusing to, uh, to pay rent uh, and there was no recourse for the owner of the house. And so a lot of people got rid of their rentals. And when that happens, those rentals turn into Airbnbs. And all of a sudden the rental pool starts to dry up which drives up the cost of actual rentals, which then makes people go, hey, if it costs as much to rent, I might as well try and buy a house, which drives up the price of housing. Uh, it's all stacked uh, and is kind of this domino effect. So until we uh, get the affordable housing thing fixed and uh, allow people to actually have rentals and actually have um, rights as a rental owner, we're gonna continue to have these issues. Okay, Mr. Broadman. Yeah, the key to bringing down costs and having a community and an economy where everybody thrives is to have a robust economy. I'm proud to serve on the board of EDCO where we bring new businesses to Central Oregon. I'm proud to serve on the Downtown Business Association. As a dad, as a small business owner, I know that the way that we make sure our community's cost of living is manageable is by growing a robust and strong economy. That's why I'm so honored to be supported by the largest business and industries organization in the state of Oregon, Oregon Business and Industries as well as every major labor organization. A rising tide raises all boats. We need to protect people uh, when they fall on hard times, and we need to find a balance to make sure that this is a community where everybody who works here can afford to live here. Okay, all right. Mr. Summers, 30 seconds. Yeah, um, if we can't afford to house our, um, our frontline workers, if we, can, if we can't afford to ha uh, house nurses uh, and laborers, people, my employees, frankly, um, the cost of everything goes through the roof. Uh, and so we have to get a hold of these skyrocketing costs uh, of housing and make it sure, making sure that um, my daughters can live here eventually. I grew up in this area. Uh, we rented for a while and then we purchased and I was able to do the same thing and start in that same way and then I was able to build uh, to to buy a house and I want my girls to have the exact same opportunity uh, and so we can grow and we can grow in a healthy way and we can deregulate we can streamline processes and make it to where everyone can live here all right thank you mr. Broadman you have 30 seconds yeah I'm really proud of the work we've accomplished in the last year the city of Bend has built more homes for working families than any other city in the state per capita I worked on, co-wrote, and, and got passed House Bill 3318, which created the first teacher priority housing development in the history of our state. And that's what it's gonna take here, right? We need to make sure that teachers, police officers, nurses, doctors, everybody in this community who makes our community run can afford to live here. All right, thank you both, both candidates. We're gonna take a short one minute break right now. When we come back, the candidates give their insights and thoughts on ODOT's Highway 97 project and legislative walkouts. Stay with us.